Good morning. Can I ask you to come in and take your seats, please? And we'll make a start this morning. Great stuff, thank you. If you'd like to take your seats. Good morning, welcome to Kenwell Bay Church. And uh, especially if you're visiting with us, I know we've got a few people here because it's half term. So welcome to you. Thank you for uh, making the time in your busy half term schedule to come and join us as we worship God together. We trust that you feel very much part of the church family this morning. Barry, would you stand up please? Connor, would you stand up, please? Linda, would you stand up, please? Karen, would you stand up, please? Stuart, would you stand up, please? Would everyone else be seated, please? Just the, just the five of them standing. That's all right. It will not hurt. There will be no pain. In a church of our size, if you man- imagine that our church represents the whole of the UK this morning, two, three, four, five out of about a hundred which are usually here, that represents the number of people who will be in church in the UK this morning. Five percent, one in twenty. We should be rejoicing that we're here today. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You can take your seats now. That was painless, Linda. It's okay. (laughs) Um, However, if my maths is right, that means 95% of the UK are not in church today. That should drive us to our knees in prayer. That should make us redouble our efforts to reach our non-Christian friends, neighbors, colleagues, family. It's a sad indictment of our nation, actually, who once thrived under the gospel, who once uh, lived its life by what we find in God's Word. But nonetheless, we can rejoice this morning because God is here with us. And He's not put off by numbers. He's not daunted by overwhelming odds. And we've seen that in the David story, haven't we? And we'll continue to see that in the David story. And my prayer, and I hope yours is too, that we'll continue to see that in the KBC story, that God continues to grow this church. And that he continues to bring in what in Scotland we might refer to as the waifs and strays. (laughs) And that people come in here and find a home, just as the men in David's cave of Adullam found a home and someone to follow. We'll begin our service in a few moments. I just wanted to do that this morning, just to emphasize, A, the state of our nation, but B, the privilege that is ours in being able to come to a place like this and focus our minds and our spirits on the Lord Jesus. Um, Can I ask you to be praying? Um, Pray for Glenis Baker tomorrow. She's facing hip replacement surgery, I believe, tomorrow. So do remember Glenis tomorrow. Um, We have a prayer meeting on Thursday morning. It will be the new month. Yes, we're in November as of this week coming. So Thursday morning at 8 o'clock, do join us for prayer here in the church. And uh, RTC is on on Thursday afternoon, am I right? 2.30. And uh, if you're able to come along to that, would be great. Next Sunday morning, it will be the first Sunday in November, we'll be uh, celebrating communion together. And that's always an important part of our church worship. Uh, And also then next Sunday evening, uh, we have our monthly evening service. That will be the last one of this year. There won't be one in December. And so I encourage you to come along next Sunday evening at 6.30 when Sarah Peterson will be uh, speaking. A couple of other things. Highlighted these recently because we've got a number of new people. Please fill in one of these welcome cards if you'd like us to get to know you a little bit better. And if you'd like to find out more about some of the things that happen in the church, simply fill one in. Leave it on the desk, on the table on your left as you leave church either today or next week. 
And then I mentioned this last week, a service of uh, thanksgiving and remembering there is on the screen for you. An opportunity for people who have lost someone dear to them just to come and give thanks for that person's life, but also to remember in a meaningful way that hopefully provides some hope going forward. Don't worry if you think, well, it, it was more than a year ago, but I'd, I'd like to come to that. That's absolutely fine. And uh, again, pick up one of the cards on your way out this morning. Um, not this week coming, but the following week, I'm going to be visiting David Lyons. Sue and Steve had a lovely visit with them this week, and he, he spoke to me on the phone after that visit, and he was, in his words, buzzing. And uh, so I'm going to be visiting him a week on Thursday. Um, so I'm going to invite you, if you'd like me to take up any gifts that you would like to give to David, maybe you think ahead of time, maybe a little Christmas gift that you could wrap up, and I'll take it up, and I'll leave it with the staff there, and so when... Christmas Day arrives, you, he's got something to, to open. Um, it will be very cold where he is over the winter, so bear that in mind. If you want to talk to Sue about clothes and sizes and things like that, because his body's changed since he left here, um, but if you want to buy him, a, I don't know, a nice woolly jumper or something like that, or a pair of socks, have a word with Sue, but do bring them no later than next Sunday. If you want to drop him in during the week, either to Elaine or myself, and I will take them up with your love when I see him. Um, this morning, it's very difficult to know how to approach what's happening in Israel and Gaza on a week-by-week -week basis. It, it's just overwhelming, and we could spend every minute of every day contemplating that. But we come to worship today just so keenly aware of the anguish and the tragedy and the horror that's just reverberating around the world. But today, as I've already said, when we gather like this, it's a day for putting our hope in God. It's a day for... Uh, praying for justice and for peace. The verse in Amos chapter 5 says, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Yes, we pray for peace. We also pray for justice. And as we begin our service today, we, we don't do this every Sunday, nor would we, but I'd like you just to stand just for a minute's silence, just as we contemplate the world and its uh, horrors, but also just where you are, just to pray uh, silently and uh, remember the people that are suffering around the world today. Can I invite you to stand and just let's have a moment's silence for you just to take your prayers to God. The words that I'm about to read are words that David wrote while he was in the wilderness. And as I prepare to read, I'm going to invite the band to come and join me now. And uh, in a moment or two, we'll begin to worship God together. You know, sometimes when you're, in, when you're in a dry place, spiritually speaking, in your life, it's just simply about surviving. It's about even with your fingernails holding on. So let's use these words of David as we prepare to worship God this morning. These are words that he wrote while he was in the desert. Psalm 63, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And that's what we're going to do now as we worship God together. Thanks, Lisa. The first song that we're singing, we've not done for a while. You might remember it from a few months back, but hopefully you'll pick it up as we continue to sing. stand before your maker full of wonder full of fear come behold his power and glory yet with confidence draw near for the one who holds the heavens and 
commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King and with trembling rejoice. children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, but with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. Rejoice! So take heart and stand amazed Rejoice When you cry to Him He is your voice He will wipe away your tears Rejoice In the midst of suffering He will help you sing Rejoice Who 
upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 they enrich the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under, the, and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. A thousand generations fall into to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Cause your name is the highest, your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry oh, holy O oh, creation song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing the song forever.
is your name, is the highest your name, is the greatest your name, stands above them all. O thrones and dominions, O powers and positions, your name stands above them all. take your seats folks. Aren't we blessed in this church to have a band who lead us in worship so well week by week? Why don't you give them your appreciation? We're not. When, when we do that, we're not bigging them up. We're bigging God up but the good that he's given us in these guys and others who serve us faithfully. So thank you all very much. Now I'm going to say a controversial statement and find out how many people are on my side in this controversial statement. I believe that it's okay to have fun in church. Anybody agree with me? Yes. Oh, that was surprising. Good. I'll take that as a, a massive endorsement for what we're about to do now then. Because um, I'm going to pick on people. I mean, get some volunteers. They're not going to be volunteers. I'm just going to tell you and you're going to come out and help me here. Uh, Lily and Kathy, and you're both looking anywhere except looking at me, so could you two come out, please, and just stand down the front here for me. Don't worry, you'll not be on your own. Out you come. Uh, Lucas, could you come out, please? That's a good lad. I always like a Man United shirt out on, on the front here at some point. Just make, stand right along at the end there and then face out that way, please. So when is that? Three. Uh, what's your name? No. This young, la young lady here, would she come out and help? No. Okay. Uh, would you like to come out and join me? One of yours, Abigail, you pick one. <laughs> and tell me which one. You coming? Right, out you come. Just one of you, just one of you. What's your name again? Well, right, good, right. So that's four. Then I'm going to choose some adults. This is when it gets really fun. Uh, who have I not picked on for a while? Lee, how you come? Yeah, thank you. Well, if you make eye contact, that's going to happen. <laughs> Jackie, you're next. Catherine, would you come out, please? Brilliant. And uh, James, you're not looking at me, but I'm picking on you. How you come? Great. So we've got eight people here all together. Great, because we're going to tell part of Saul's story together. But don't worry, guys, it's not just you. All you are is like the cue cards for the rest of the congregation. Because I'm going to give each of them an action to do. Every time a certain word is used in the story that I'm about to tell, you're all going to have an action to do, okay? And when you do the action, they're going to copy you. So the better you do your action, the more response they're, we're going to get from this lot out here. Is that okay? So... You really are the, the trainers, if you like, for, for the, the people out here. So, Lee, 
Since you stood at that end, you'll get the first one. When I say in the story, any time I say the word jealous, I want you to cross your arms and look moody. Can you do that, Lee? Let's see you looking, let's see you looking moody. Do it out to them so everybody can see your best moody. Right, can you all do that? When I say the word jealous, jealous. Oh, Debbie, I wish I'd chosen you. Um, okay, who's next? Right. Anytime I say the word kill or killed, something like that, Jackie, you, you should know this because you go to all of these weekend murder mystery weekends. So this, all oh, right, you're not, right, okay. All right, well, anytime I use the word kill or killed, you're going to take a sharp intake of breath and put your hand on your chest. So it's, oh, look at this, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, when are the Oscar nominations? When, so I'm going to do it again. Jackie's going to do it. You're all going to do it. Kill! You're very good at this. It's almost as if you've done it before. Right, Lily. This is a good one. Hide or hiding. Anytime I say hide or hiding, cover your head with your hands and then stoop down out of sight like that. Okay? So try that for me. Hide or hiding. You try it. Come on. It's not rocket science, Lily. Come on. Anytime I say the word hide or hiding, hands on your head and down. There you go. You can do it sat down. So hide or hiding. They've all got this. Uh, who's next? Kathleen. Oh, you'll love this. Anytime I use the word cave, I want you to do this. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> so that's like an echo, right? Cave. Hello, 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 hello. No, she's not done it yet. Don't you help her. <laughs> hey, Kathleen. That's you. Cave. No, you're doing her one. I'll help you. Cave. Hello, hello, hello. Right, everyone together. Cave. Hello, hello. hello. It should be getting quieter each time. That's the idea. Right, young man. You have got Lou, as in toilet. <laughs> so, any time, any time that I say the word Lou, I want you to pretend that you're banging on a door. Try that first of all. Bang the door. That's it. And shout in the top voice. Hurry up in there. <laughs> Try that. So anyway, I'm going to say Lou, and you're going to go. Go on, do it then. Hurry up in there. Oh, I said your top voice, loudest voice. Here we go, Lou. Hurry up in there. Excellent, right? So I'm going to say Lou, and you're going to go. Now I'm going to put you two together. All right? You're going to have the same one, right? So when I say the word creep or crept creeping, something like that. I want you to pretend you're tiptoeing and then freeze like that. And then freeze. Oh, look at this. Now, that's going to be harder for you to do sat down, but ha do your very best, right? So these guys will help you. They'll show you what to do. Creep or creeping. Excellent. And then, young man, you know, save the best to last, don't I? So when I say the word sword... You're going to just do this. That's it. Give me the sound effect, though. There you go. So, sword. Everyone else? Let's just run through them then. Jealous. Can you remember jealous? Kill. Hiding. Cave. Only four hellos, please, if you don't mind. Uh, Lou <laughs> Creep Sword Hiding Jealous Cave <laughs> You'll get the idea Right, here we go with the story uh, Listen, they're your help If they don't help you, no one else will, right? So you have to try and remember Here we go with the story I need my glasses on for this bit So, King Saul had once been a good king. But as he got older, he went off the rails a bit. He and David had once been good friends, but now Saul was very jealous of David, and he wanted to kill him. So David had to hide in a cave out in the desert. One day, as Saul was out searching for David to try and kill him, he went into the cave... To go to the loo. 
But he didn't realize that David was hiding in that very cave. And when David saw Saul creep inside on his way to use the loo, they got it quicker than you that time. You weren't paying attention. I'm going to do that line again so that you can catch up. Remember, face that way. So, when David saw Saul creep inside on his way to use the loo, David thought to himself, now's my chance. I can kill Saul and then he won't be able to kill me. So David crept forward in the darkness and lifted up his sword. (laughs) It's like Star Wars all of a sudden, isn't it? Saul didn't see him and now David had the perfect chance to kill him. But as he stood there, sword in hand, David changed his mind. He knew that God had once chosen Saul to be king. And even though Saul was jealous of David and wanted to kill him, that didn't mean that David should do the same to Saul. So instead, David took his sword and sliced off the bottom of Saul's cloak. And then he crept away back into the darkness of the cave. Some of you have stopped doing it. When Saul turned round and left the cave, David followed him outside and shouted to him, My Lord, the King! And he bowed down to Saul. Then he said, Look at your cloak. I was hiding in that cave when I saw you creep in. I could have killed you. But I didn't. If you don't believe me, look at your cloak. It's a bit shorter than it used to be. Then Saul realized the truth and he began to cry. You're a better man than me, he said. I was jealous of you, but you had the chance to kill me with your sword. And you didn't. Thank you for not punishing me. Thank you for being kind. One day, God will make you king and reward you for what you've done today. After that, Saul went home and David went back to his cave. Give them all a round of applause. Let me go, guys. Thank you so much. That's, that's kind of my sermon later as well. So should we just go? No, no it's not. Um, what we're going to do before the young people and the children go off to their activity, I'm going to pray for them. And uh, as they leave, we'll take up our offering. And then the band, they're going to come and lead us in one more song just now. Let's pray for the youngsters. Father, thank you that uh, our young people come to church faithfully. They learn about you week by week. Lord, we pray that many of the stories that they learn about Jesus would just take seed in their heart and that they would grow up knowing that you're a God who loves them and who has a place in your kingdom for them. Thank you for half term and all of the opportunities that that presents for us. Lord, we recognize some of our church family are away this week. We pray for them wherever they are. And uh, for others who have joined us today, Lord, we thank you. Pray now that as the young people and the children go to their activities, that you will go with them, bless them, speak to them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the boys and girls and the young people want to head out. And uh, we'll take up our offering. If Elisa, you want to come up and just play for us just now in the band, come and join us as well now. We'll move on in our service shortly. stand together. We're going to sing Who You Say I Am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost but he brought me in oh his love Free indeed, I'm a 
was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I Back in the 80s, uh, there was a children's evangelist by the name of Ian Smale who changed his name for all his recording purposes to Ishmael. Anybody remember Ishmael? Some of you. And one of the songs that he wrote uh, is just what I want to use as a prayer before we open God's word together. Let God speak and I will listen. Let God speak. There's things I'm needing to put right. Let God speak and I will obey what he says. Father, that's our prayer this morning, that as we approach your word humbly, that you'll speak through it. Lord, we've been reminded numerous times recently that your word does not return to you void, but it achieves its purposes. So Lord, help us now as we look into your word. Speak to us by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're in 1 Samuel today, again, chapter 24. I encourage you to look it up in your Bible if you would like to borrow uh, a church Bible, please just raise your hand and someone will be glad to bring you one and uh, then we can read together. The words will also appear on the screen. Um, 1 Samuel 24, reading from verse 1 and reading from the New International Version. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. 
David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul, and Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day, excuse me, this day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he's the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there's nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you've done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea. May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You're more righteous than I. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You've just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul and Saul returned home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold or back to the cave. And it's quite a remarkable encounter, isn't it? And we saw it played out beautifully earlier. But uh, I hope that we can put some flesh on the bones of that passage just now. So David still knew that Saul wanted to kill him. He kept on running in the wilderness, his very own wild west, really. King Saul had his spies out, keeping an eye on David's movements and promised that David would surely die. David and his men were hiding out in the desert. This desert that we read was called En Gedi, which means the place of springs and goats. Saul got word of this, and he gathered his strongest 3,000 soldiers, and he set off to this place called En Gedi. And he came to this place called the Crags of the Wild Goats. It's not somewhere you might want to go on holiday. You're not going to find it on booking.com, are you? Well, they'd been traveling. It's very hot in the desert, and Saul, we know, he needed to go to the bathroom. Not many of them out in the desert. So he finds a nearby cave and goes in to use it as a toilet. Unknown to King Saul, David and his men are in the cave, a cave like this one. They're far back in the darkness of the cave when they saw Saul coming into the cave, not with all his soldiers, but on his own. David's men start to whisper to him, right, David, this is your chance to kill him. He's all alone. And David goes crossed his soul very quietly with his sword in his hand and his men think this is it he's going to kill him history is going to change today but instead and we know he cut off a corner of Saul's long robe so leaves the cave David calls out to him see this piece of robe I have here I could have killed you but I'm not going to lay my hand on you and Saul realizes the narrow escape that he's had and he thanks David and you're a better man than I am he says to him one day you're going to make a great king now, that would have been lovely if the story ended there and everyone lived happily ever after, wouldn't it? But Saul didn't stop trying to kill David. Not long afterwards, Saul is again hunting David down out in the wilderness of Judah with his 3,000 men. 
and in chapter 26, which we don't have time to, to read it today, but I encourage you to look at it. From his hiding place in the mountains, David looks down in the valley and he sees Saul's camp and all his soldiers, all 3,000 of them down there. It's the middle of the night. David calls one of his men, a man called Abishai, and they, the two of them climb down quietly into the middle of Saul's camp while all the guards are sleeping. They find Saul where he's sleeping with his, saw, his spear standing in the ground at his head and a bottle of water near it. Now, Abishai knew from what David had said that David wasn't going to kill King Saul. So he says to him, let me kill him. I'll do it. David says, no, you mustn't kill him. He's still the king. The only person who has the right to end his life is God. We'll take his spear, we'll take his water bottle, and then we'll go. Next slide, Elaine, please. So they walk out of the camp without wakening anyone. And in the morning, again, David calls down from his high position and he calls down to Saul's men, mocking them really. Why have you not kept watch over your king? I've got the spear here. I've got his water bottle. What kind of guards are you? Twice, David has had the chance to kill Saul. Twice, he's refused it. He knew it'd be wrong, even though Saul was his enemy. And even though Saul was hell-bent on trying to kill David. Sometimes people do things to us or against us which provoke us to anger, don't they? And often, our default setting, our reflex is, I'm going to get even. I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to be just as horrible to them as they were to me. In fact, I'm going to be even more horrible. I'm going to make them wish they'd never done such and such. But this is a great lesson to us. That's not God's way. God tells us to love our enemies. Just like David, to show mercy to everyone, even those people who we don't get on with. Or even those people who make it very clear that they don't like us. Who like to wind us up. Who like to pick on us. Who like to highlight and criticize every little thing that we do wrong. Well, very quickly this morning, I just want, us, I want to draw out three things that are going to help us, hopefully, in our wilderness moments from this encounter in the rocks of the wild goats. The first thing I want us to notice is that we are to see God's glory where we least expect it. Chapter 24, verse 10 says, This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. Here's David. He's surrounded by his men. They're telling him what to do. This is your chance. This is what you've been waiting for. This is the king, your sworn enemy. The man who's hunting us all down like dogs and who's intent on killing you and us. And he's right there. He's within arm's reach. He's within sword's reach. And what's more, he's on his own. And what's more, he's in the most vulnerable position imaginable. David, it's a dream come true. It's a golden opportunity. David, carpe diem, seize the day. And as you see this scene being played out, and we've read it a couple of times today already, you know, there is an element of pantomime about it. Where the audience, if it was a pantomime, would be joining in with cries of, he's behind you! And they'd be booing the baddie Saul and they'd be cheering the goodie, our hero David. This is going to be it, the climax of the play. David will kill Saul. He'll seize power. He'll become Israel's king at last. Hooray! But no, David withstands the pressure of the crowd. He confounds all of their expectations and he chooses to follow his heart rather than his head. Because David is guided by his heart. Samuel had predicted to Saul that such a man would replace him. We read that earlier on in 1 Samuel 13. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said to Saul. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you, Saul, have not kept the Lord's command. David was God's anointed one. David was God's chosen one. And as such, he was fulfilling the words of the prophet Samuel. He was the man after God's own heart. 
So when he looks on his enemy in a position of vulnerability, he chooses not to kill him. Why? Because David understands God's sovereignty. David is willing to put aside his own personal desire and opportunity, and he relies on God instead. Despite all the voices telling him otherwise, David stays true to his beliefs, and he does the right thing. Now, I don't know what it's like for you where you live or where you work or perhaps where you study, but it's probably no different to any other where people hang about in their groups and they gravitate towards those who are most like them and groups where they feel comfortable and unthreatened. I heard of one school uh, where there were easily recognizable groups who each held their own territory in the school grounds, if you like. And there was one day when a new girl came along and she was starting at the school, middle of term, just arrived and about to start in a new school. And if you've ever done that, you'll know just how daunting that is. She was nervous. This was made even worse when she appeared at the school gates because she walked into a square courtyard which was empty. But around the edges of this square courtyard were all the pupils standing in their distinct groupings. You had the smokers just outside the gate. You had the cool crew, the trendies with all the designer labels. Then over there you had the goths and the skaters. You had the nerds over here swapping uh, computer tips. And uh, then you had the athletic types, all the different groups that people fit into and many more besides. There was a place for everyone and everyone was firmly in their place. No one moved from group to group and certainly no one crossed the square courtyard, schoolyard. So this girl walked nervously and she walked into the middle. There was a few sharp intakes of breath. She felt a hundred eyes piercing into her back. And then she stumbled and she dropped her bag and all her books spilt out onto the ground. There was a few giggles. There was a lot of pointing. And now she's crying, huddled over her belongings, wishing she was anywhere else except there. There were a few teachers up in the staff room looking on, wondering what's going to happen now. And what did happen next was extraordinary. One boy stepped out of his group and he walked the 30 or so steps into the middle, helped her to her feet and carried her bags and her books with her and escorted her into her class. That took guts, took courage. When everyone else is doing one thing, it's incredibly hard to do the right thing. That boy did it. I used to own a t-shirt. In fact, I've got a picture of it here. I don't have it anymore. I wouldn't fit it anyway. But um, this has some fish on it. I think you can see it. Uh, The fish were horrific looking fish, maybe piranhas and sharks, very sharp teeth, very jaggy fins. And you can see they're all going in one direction. Uh, They're not nice fish. They're all swimming the same way. They're all looking mean. They're all looking menacing. And then just uh, in one, one fish, you can see that I've circled in a red line there, you see one other fish going the opposite way, this pleasant-looking fish, a bit like the one good Christians have on their cars, you know? Uh, And I mean those Christians who don't go over 20 miles an hour in the the streets of Wales, okay? So, but there's a verse at the bottom, you won't be able to read it. And the verse is this, it's from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform. Now, As usual, Eugene Peterson's treatment of that verse and the verses around it in the message paraphrase is very interesting and helpful. Here's what he says. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Do you think that you cannot make a difference in your workplace or in your school, or in your college, or in your family, or in your street? Do you think it's too hard because of what everyone else will say, or what they'll think of you, 
or because you have a quite a low value of yourself or because you have quite a low opinion and think, I'm not that good a Christian. Well, here's another story I heard recently about a boy named Johan. He made a poster of himself and he copied it and he put it up around his school with these words. I'm a Christian, ask me why. Within a day, over 40 people had stopped him and asked him about his faith. I'm a Christian, ask me why. See, we can do the right thing. We can swim against the tide. God calls us, after all, that we are salt and light. And salt, what does it do? It brings flavor to a tasteless world. Light is at its most effective when it's displayed amidst darkness, and the darkness can't exist alongside it. Back to David, what does he do? He chooses God's glory over his own, God's agenda over his own, God's desire over his own, and he chooses to obey. He was able to do this, I suggest to you, because his focus was on God. His focus was on the things of God. He was a man whose heart was like God's. His big picture thinking was more important than an instant victory over a defenseless king in a cave. David wanted to be operating in God's will, and he chose to honor Saul's position as God's appointed, anointed king. And he believed, above all things, that God would work it out. And so he was content to put his head on the pillow, or maybe a stone probably in the cave. He was content to put his head at rest at night, knowing that God was in control. What about you? Can you find God's glory in your wilderness? Where is he waiting to be revealed in your circumstances? Can you see a way of putting God's glory above your own? If not, is is it a matter of pride? Do you have others who are giving you counsel or advice which goes against God's word, what you know to be true? Do you have a crowd egging you on, cheering you on to do the wrong thing? Or are you willing to lose face in order to please God? Do you share David's belief, his certainty that God is enough and God will work it out? And if you do, then maybe you will see God at work where you least expect it. Second thing I want us to notice is holy living in an unholy world. You see, it could be costly to make the right decision. Maybe you know that. And David knows that if he follows his men's advice that later that day there's going to be a coronation and he'll be king. All his wilderness days will be over. He'll be enthroned. He will reign over Israel. Let the good times roll if he follows his men's advice. But we know that he doesn't. We know that he chooses to follow God. And in choosing to do so, there seems less certainty about what will follow, doesn't there? which is quite counterintuitive for us. Certainly for David, the coronation is off, or at least it's on hold. There will be no street parties tonight. David remembered and trusted in the words that the man of God had spoken over over him that day when he was called in from the fields and paraded in front of all his older brothers. Do you remember when Samuel anointed him and told him that he will be king one day? And this is important for us because on the day when things are hard, or when the outlook seems bleak, when the enemy tries to convince us of our worthlessness or our ineffectiveness as a Christian, those are the very days when we need to go back to the times when we have clearly heard God's call on our life, when we have heard His voice, when we recognized His voice, even going back to that very first day when we trusted Him, when we entered into His kingdom. As someone said to me a number of years ago, don't forget in the darkness what you have learned in the light, what God has shown you in the light. Am I going to cling on to the word of God and trust even though I can't see the way ahead? That's where David was in the cave. And this was the crux of his decision. And that's the same for every Christian ever since. Can I trust God? Now, I I, I mean, I believe God can be 
be trusted. That's not something I question. I believe He's a good God. I certainly believe that He will never let me down. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never abandon me. I have no worries on that score. He is utterly reliable. The question is not about God. It's about me. Maybe it's about you. Can I put my trust in God? When it comes down to it, when I'm in a moment of crisis, when I'm faced with a moral dilemma, when I'm in the wilderness being tracked by my enemy, when the devil is tempting me to sin, will I choose to trust God? Will I be intentional? Will I be proactive? Because trusting God is not a passive thing. It won't happen to you. It's something that you do and make happen. Will I make the right decision? Will I choose the holy path for my life? All around me are falling away. The world I live in is doing its best to seduce me and corrupt me. It's so difficult to be holy. It's so difficult to choose righteousness when the sin on offer looks so good. Sin is, by its very nature, attractive and enticing. That fruit in the Garden of Eden, that looked ripe. That looked ready for the eating. But you know, sometimes I I like the thought of me being crowned king of my own kingdom. I like the idea of a street party being thrown in my honor. But I also know in my heart of hearts that down that path lies death. The wages of sin is... And that fruit, all rosy and shiny on the outside, is poison on the inside. And it might not happen immediately. But after the party has died down, after all the guests have gone home, when I return to the solitude of my wilderness, when I've walked away from God and His plan for my life, I will be even more acutely aware of the desert vultures overhead, ready to pick away at my bones. We, brothers and sisters, we are to be people of God who choose holiness, who display salt and light to an increasingly stale and dark world. I call to mind the words of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Finally, this morning we come to our third point, allowing God to be God. When we see God's glory where we least expect it, when we find him in the midst of our circumstances, when we discover that he's been with us all along, when perhaps we thought he'd abandoned us, when we choose to make those holy choices in an unholy world, then we are delighting our Father God. And when we surrender our will to His, that's when He can really begin to demonstrate His power in us and through us. Just think for a moment of your enemy in the wilderness, if you have one. Whether that's a past battle that's been dealt with already, or whether you're in that place of wilderness, that dry place that we spoke of earlier, right now in your life. Maybe it's an actual enemy. Maybe it's a person who seeks to destroy you by word or action. Maybe it's a less tangible enemy than that. Maybe it's something like stress or anxiety, depression, finance, family difficulties, employment issues, church politics, insecurity as a person, uncertainty of your faith. Maybe there's an injustice in your life. Maybe there's memories of your past. Things which you just can't quite seem to get over. Well, let me ask you all a question. And this is not one of those questions where I'm not looking for an answer. I am looking for an answer. Is God bigger than your enemy? Is God bigger than your enemy? Yes. Has he ever been confounded by someone or something that's just too big for him to handle? You know, as believers in the risen Lord Jesus, the one who's beaten the final enemy, death itself, we believe the answer to be an emphatic no. There's nothing that's too big for God to handle. Yes, he's much bigger than your enemy. 
which means something. It means this. It means that the ball is in your court. Will we, will you today allow God to be God? Are you going to simply survive or are you going to thrive? Are you going to exist or are you going to live? I mean, really live. Life in all its fullness. That's what Jesus said he came to bring you. Are you living with life in all its fullness? I was sharing with Stephen and Diana earlier about a, a guy that I knew in Leven many 20 years ago, maybe in the church there. And any time I met Robert, whether it was down the street or on the golf course or in church, I would say, how are you doing, Robert? How's things? Just living in the victory. I'm living in the victory. And whether we say it every day, we ought to all be doing that every day. Living in the victory. If we are prepared to lay down our burdens, the things that have us on the run, and we can place them before God, and we say to God, your will be done. I believe then our enemies will be dealt with. God will reign in our lives. We will be people described as being after God's own heart. We can move from a barren wilderness experience into a promise of better things to come. Certain, like David, that it's in God's hands and it's in God's time. So today, we've homed in on chapter 24. I I would love to have spent uh, a little bit longer looking at the chapters either side of it, 23 and 25, but because there's really important stuff in there in the life of David. Um, There's more thrilling adventures there from this most exciting character, more lessons for us to learn from God's Word, and so uh, I would encourage you to look at that in the week. And as you read it, give thanks to God for His Word. As you open its pages this week, ask the Holy Spirit to guide your mind, to interpret alongside you what you read, to give you insight, to give you understanding, and then ask Father God to give you courage and determination to put His teaching into your life in action. My prayer for you, for us as a church, is that we will indeed find God where we least expect Him. That we will live holy lives against the backdrop of unholiness that surrounds us. And that whatever our circumstances this week, that we will each find a way to allow God to be God, trusting in His will, trusting in His sovereignty in all things, moving out of the wilderness moving into the land of good things that God has promised us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll invite the band to come back and lead us in our closing worship, and then I'll come back and pray at the end of our service. Thank you. stand together, shall we? The Lord's my share my way
voices and I will trust in you and I will trust in you As ever, if anything has been said this morning or there's something that's troubling you or you just want to talk to someone or have someone pray with you, come and speak to someone after the service, myself or Darren, Lisa, any of the guys in the band, or somebody that you know who brought you to church this morning. Equally, if you would find it helpful to fill in one of the welcome cards and make an appointment to come in and speak for a bit longer, we'll happily do that and help anyone. Let's pray now. Lord, we pray that you would accompany us on the road ahead this week. Watch over us. Equip us. Feed us. Excite us and encourage us as we keep our eyes fixed on you, that we might serve you, bless you, and honor you. For you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being with us. There is tea and coffee available through here and we'd love it if you'd stay and join us for that, especially if you're visiting today. Thank you and God bless you.